Welcome to part 4 of my series about the modular soft synth solo rack. In this second tutorial I talk about the other oscillator modules of solo rack which are left out in tutorial 3. And because not all of you may have watched the first three tutorials in this series, I, like always at the beginning, repeat, those of you who are new to the matter of modular synthesis and maybe not only the absolute beginners, will get all explanations they need to understand what's going on in this video and in all of the following ones, so that everybody can follow and enjoy this series. So, if you watch all parts of this series, you will build up a comprehensive knowledge, knowledge base, especially about modular synthesis, but also about synthesis in general. I'll share a remarkable part of my over 40 years of working with synthesizers with you in this series. Be patient and stay curious. All right. Let's add an oscillator to the rack now. And it's again going to be the S310 VCO. There have been some questions since publishing my last video about this oscillator. Some of them are really interesting and should be answered here before I continue with the other three oscillators of Solorec. First question. Why did I use an amplifier module to modulate the strength of FM modulation when there is an FM knob to regulate this parameter on uh, the S310 itself? Well, regulating and modulating are two different things. I can regulate the strength of the FM with the FM knob. That's right. Regulate in the meaning of adjust it to a certain amount. I can get nice little vibrations that way. But when I want to modulate, to modulate the strength of FM, modulated the meaning of changing in time, I must do it manually by turning the knob. I need the amplifier module to make these changes going on automatically or following a certain pattern in time, which is created, for example, by a second LFO. Second question. Do we always get those harsh sounds when we sync on um, oscillator uh, the slave by another, the, the master? Answer. No, not always. Even if the sync function is mostly used to get harsher, more remarkable sounds, you can get quite non-aggressive sounds as well. It depends on the relation of the frequencies, the frequency of the master and that of the slave, and on the waveforms, of course. With the master's wave being, for example, sine or triangle, the resulting sounds tend to be smoother than those you get with saw or square as the master's waveform. And uh, by the way, there is also less aliasing with those waveforms. The third question concerning my last tutorial is not a question, but a correction. 
when I talked about the RA knob and uh, the sync mode band, I offhandedly said in a half sentence, let me quote myself, but there is a second function of the rectifier when the sync mode band is chosen. We can change the shape and the sound of the synchronization, of course, only with a sine wave. And that is wrong. In band mode, the RA knob smooths the result of the synchronization with all wave forms. Only when it works as a half wave rectifier, its course is limited to sine wave, to sine waves. I apologize for making this mistake. Well, but now for the other oscillators. Let's start with the S304. This oscillator delivers only two basic waveforms, saw and square. But the S304 generates both of them two times two detunable saw waves and two detunable square waves. The range of frequencies of the oscillator covers 13 octaves and a certain frequency is adjusted with a big fat knob called Tune. Well, of course, what else? This knob has a very smooth slew which makes it easy to adjust it at any position I want. The small detune knob covers a range of an octave, so that the relation of the two frequencies of, a, of the waves reaches from 1 to 1 up to 1 to 2. But let's be meticulous. The same frequency doesn't mean the same phase. Please listen and watch the upper analyzer, which is in uh, oscilloscope mode, and shows the wave when I change the tuning, increase the amount of detuning, and return to one and the same single frequency again. Same as with the S310 are both waveforms available simultaneously. But let's look into the detune functionality a bit more thoroughly. There is a detune out jack next to the detune knob. This jack delivers control voltage CV. I can, for example, do something crazy and adjust the cutoff frequency of a filter unit using this detune out jack and the detune knob. Or I can adjust the frequency of an oscillator using this output jack and the detune knob. But 
hey, what's that? We discovered that the detune knob has a frequency range of one octave a while ago. When we talked about detuning one of the frequencies of the S304 against the other, but now it has a frequency range of two octaves. And indeed, controlling another unit, the range of control, which can be adjusted using the detune knob, detune knob, sorry, and which comes out of the detune out jack, covers a range of two octaves. Only when detune is used to adjust the relation of the two frequencies of its own unit, the range is reduced to one octave. And it is, of course, the same with the second S302 instead of a signed sub oscillator. The frequency range is still two octaves. Okay, but the purpose the detune out jack is really made for is a bit different from what I have been talking about the last few minutes. We can take the detuning and therefore the super saw character, respectively the super square character, to the next dimension by combining two or more S304 units. I start with only two and a mixer of course. Alright now, we will have to find out how the two detune knobs work, how they work together. We have to answer the question, which knob does what to the sound. To find out, I delete the mixer and connect both oscillators to different stereo channels. The green graphs are those from the left VCO, the blue graphs belong to the right VCO. We don't need the waveform for our next investigations. I close the upper oscillator, uh, sorry, analyzer and start changing the detuned values with both knots.
let me analyze what's going on. The detune knob of the left, the green oscillator, splits, of course, the green output frequency into two. The maximal possible difference of one octave. And detunes the basic frequency of the right, the blue oscillator, against the left oscillator up to a difference of maximally two octaves. The detune knob of the right, the blue oscillator, splits, of course, the blue frequency into two, with a maximal possible difference of one octave, but leaves the green frequency alone. No, of course it does. There is no detuning of the basic frequencies of the two oscillators, the green one and the blue one. Using both knobs we can spread the four frequencies over an area of all in all three octaves. Just to make it clear, the big fat tune knob on top influences only the frequencies of its own oscillator. quite straightforward so far. But it gets more complex when I add a third S304 to the patch. Now we have two basically different ways to patch the three detune objects. From one and the same detune object parallel to the CV input jacks of both of the other two oscillators, right part of the picture, or in series from one detune out jack to the CV input jack of the next oscillator and from the detune out jack of this second oscillator to, the, to uh, the CV input jack of the third oscillator. Parallel first. When I increase the value of the detune knob of the leftmost oscillator, let me call it the root oscillator, its output frequency splits into two, like always, and the two output frequencies of the other two S304s walk away from the basic frequency of the root oscillator until they have reached a distance of two octaves. Their frequencies stay the same, their volume levels add to each other. In the graph, the height of their common and shared partial is bigger than the height of the two split frequencies of the root oscillator. Fiddling with the detune knob of the second oscillator, the one in the middle, or playing with the detune knob of the rightmost oscillator influences, of course, only the output of the oscillator whose knob I am turning. But now for the patch with all three S304s in series. With detuning of oscillator 2 and 3 adjusted to zero, the detune knob of the leftmost oscillator works as it did before. The detune amount which reaches the oscillator in the middle is simply unchanged reached through to the rightmost oscillator. Let me increase the detune parameter of oscillator 2, the oscillator in the middle now.
the fundamental partial, as well as the other common partials, of course, split into three. <coughs> I'm sorry. The lower two ones are generated by the two detuned frequencies of oscillator 2, and the third, the highest one, is generated by oscillator 3, the rightmost oscillator. There is an interesting question to answer. Does the amount of detune from oscillator 1, the leftmost one, influence the distances between the partials which are generated by oscillator 2? the one in the middle. Well, let me increase the detune at oscillator 1 then. And we see that changing the detune of an oscillator which is earlier in the chain moves the whole group of partials which are generated by oscillators which are later in the chain, but it does not influence the relative distances between those partials of the later oscillators. The frequency relation in the moved group stay unchanged. Well, detuning even the third, the rightmost oscillator, doesn't lead to surprising occurrences anymore now. And as we can use as many S304s as we want in a patch, I am tempted to say things like SuperSaw was yesterday, now we have HyperSaw. And just a hint. Throw some deep sub-oscillators to the patch, put a low-pass filter in front of the 2DAW unit and modulate the filter cutoff. Just right. Who needs dope? that smoke when we can make sounds like that. Okay. Linear through zero frequency modulation now. I explained the term through zero in the last video of this series when I talked about the S310 oscillator. For all of you who want to dive deeper into frequency modulation, I've added a link to my very detailed series about digital frequency modulation in the description. The uh, S310 has got exponential through 0 FM, whereas the, the um, S304 works with linear through 0 FM. This means that the modulation causes um, frequency changes of the same amount of hertz downwards as well as upwards. But the same amount in hertz means not the same amount in octaves, not the same musical intervals, not the same number of notes in human perception of tonal relations. One octave down means half the frequency, in our example from 250 hertz down to 125 hertz. But one octave up means double the frequency here, 500 hertz, but the upwards range of our linear FM reaches only up to 250 plus 125 equals 375 hertz. Not an octave at all. Let me demonstrate the difference comparing the FM response of the S310 and the S304.
The spectrum shows nicely how both oscillators produce a unison sound at the lower end of the frequency sweep and run out of unison and into an interval at the higher end of the frequency sweep. The consequences of this are manifold. Let's use an LFO to make a vibrato. With linear FM the strength of vibrato seems to diminish the higher the pitch of the plate node is, whereas it seems to diminish with lower pitches, lower notes with exponential FM. Um, if you want to reproduce this ex experiment, please take care that the strength of modulation is adjusted to the same amount with both oscillators. Well, this is not an FM tutorial. Let just one last demonstration be sufficient for today, therefore. I use the S302 sine oscillator as a modulator again. I increase the strength of modulation with both FM methods and compare without a lot of explanations. The upper graph belongs to the S304 with linear FM, the lower one to the S310 with exponential FM.
perhaps one very last note. With exponential FM, the perceived pitch of the note changes differently from the way it does with linear FM. So, the pitch itself, not only the timbre, the sound, seems to change, and that in a different way, depending on what FM method we are using. Linear FM was the method used in the famous synths of the Yamaha DX series, DX7 and so on. There would be tons of aspects to mention about linear and exponential FM, but as said, this is not an FM tutorial or workshop. And with that said, I leave the S304 oscillator unit for a while and turn my attention to the S302 dual sub-sign VCO. It seems to be a simple thing, this S302, a unit which doesn't give us much to talk about, so you might think, well, you are mistaken. Functionality first. The unit contains two independent oscillators. Both deliver a pure and clean sine wave, but are equipped with an octave switch. Both, sorry, both are equipped with an, with an octave switch. The range of the switch doesn't only reach from minus 3 to plus 3, as the GUI may make you think, but from minus 6 to plus 6, and covers a huge spectrum of frequencies from sub-audio to even higher than the signal analyzer is able to measure. The lower sign oscillator has got a tune knob. Its range is one octave. The CV input jack on top of the unit influences the frequencies of both oscillators at the same time and to the same amount. Different tunings of the oscillators stay untouched, of course. So far the obvious things. Now for some details. The oscillators in the unit are not synced. Their phase is different from each uh, different from each other. Only by chance it may be equal sometimes. This can lead even to phase cancellation. Please use my synchronization trick from the last video if you need them to be in phase all the time.
The S302 is usually put into a patch to emphasize certain frequencies, often the bass frequencies. But let's not underestimate the abilities of the S302. So, what about that, for example? Doing some FM with two or more S302s doesn't only reproduce the bell sounds of the 1980s, and not only them, but also leads us to a special kind of synthesis, sine wave frequency modulation. Let's stay for a while and do some experiments. We may want to play a melody with these sine wave FM sounds. One possible patch to do so is this one. The important thing with this patch is that both the modulated left S302 and the modulating right S302 get the note signal from your door. And as there is only one CV input jack at the S302, we have to use a mixer to feed both the modulating signal from the right S302 and the note signal from the door into the left S302. There are the following points to influence the sound in the patch. The strength of modulation, which we can adjust with the right PCA. frequency of the modulating S302, of course. And with a mixer to adjust to which amount the note signal and to which amount mount the modulating S302 influences the sound. Well, next aspect. Some of you may remember the so-called algorithms of uh, Yamaha's DX series. For those who don't, the way different modulating oscillators are combined was called an algorithm. Don't worry, you'll see what this means at once. I'm going to reproduce some of these algorithms with a couple of Solorex S302 units now. First, 
two modulating S302s modulate one modulated S302 parallel to each other. Next, one S302 modulates another S302, which then modulates, with its already modulated signal, the last S302, which delivers the result to the outputs. And now a, combi a combination of both, in series and parallel. The number of possible combinations and the number of possi possible sounds are theoretically uncountable. Imagine that you can equip each of the functional groups with filters and ADSRs and you can connect some of them to the node output of your DAW and some not. And think of feedback loops and and and. By the way, what I called functional group 
meaning the oscillator and the filter and an envelope, was called an operator back in the 1980s. Well, I think you've got it. The number of possibilities is unlimited, the length of this video is not. Let me go to the noise unit, therefore. Besides the usual white noise and pink noise, the unit offers a third kind of noise called radio. Color and intensity of this radio noise can be adjusted. The analyzers show spectrum and waveform from pink noise left and white noise middle and radio in the right. Uh, right. The radio noise delivers, together with the filter, the most natural sounding and most interesting sound effects. And the following patch also sounds best with radio. The noise is hacked into short pulses by the amplifier envelope combination in the upper rack. From the VCO, the signal goes to the mixer and from there to the delay. Here, the signal is split into one part going directly to the outputs and another part, which is fed into a feedback loop back to the mixer from where it goes to the delay's input again. The sound is determined by the length of the pulses, the strength of the feedback, which I can regulate in the mixer. And 
the delay time. Again, something to puzzle, to puzzle about here at the end. Okay, let me say goodbye now, and for now. <laughs> let it be enough for today. In my next tutorial about Solarec, I'm going to talk about the filter units in detail, and then there will, of course, be a patch again. Thank you for watching. There is a website of mine at www.rofilm-media.net where you will find more information about this video and of, about this series of tutorials and you will also find an overview about all things I'm currently working on there, including all four of my YouTube channels. There is also a forum there, the Deep Sound Divers Coffee House, where you can discuss my videos. I work only part-time to be able to produce videos like this one and I depend, really, on donations to do so. If also you want to support my work, please click on the link in the comments to this video and donate a bit. Thank you. And now, have a great day and a good time, Rolf. <laughs>